one way to kind of look at art is, um, you know, obviously the execution, how was it painted? Um, what's it painted of? But also concept. If I were to look at Ray Troll's work, it's very concept, uh, like kind of based on puns, uh, which is hilarious and just brings his sense of humor to canvas. Mine is not pun based. So mine is much more like kind of whimsical, fantastical, like what what would I want to see right here? What would just totally blow my mind? That was Derek DeYoung shedding a little light on some of the great fly fishing artists out there, including Ray Troll. Today we find out what really makes a great fly fishing artist tick. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Wet Fly Swing Show. If you get a quick chance, head over to wetflyswing.com slash members and uh, join the members group. This is a good chance to uh, share a little, uh, go a little deeper and share some stories with uh, some of the folks in the community. Uh, Derek DeYoung, uh, the man behind some of the most unique fly fishing art, tells his story today. We find out how he got one of his first breaks with Sims, and we find out how um, his his passion for art got started long, long time ago. Uh, Derek tells a pretty good story about his uh, his stepdad coming in and, and uh, straightening him out as he, as he was getting his business going. Um, this is a good one. Uh, we dug into some good tangents on this one as well, so you can see uh, get a little insight into what what made Derek what separated him from the rest of the pack. Um, and uh, we also talk a little bit, uh, another shout out to Anglers Coffee, wetflyswing.com slash anglers. Um, they have a new series going on where Derek DeYoung is actually printing some art on their bag. So you can check that out right now if you head over to Anglers Coffee. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Tokens Fly Shop, providing superior products at an affordable price. An amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Togans has been over-delivering on price, service, and passion, and now it's time to discover the Togans buzz for yourself. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans to get started today. You support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Togans online. That's wetflyswing.com slash Togans, T-O-G-E-N-S. Togans! So, without further ado, here is Derek DeYoung. How's it going, Derek? Hey, what's up, Dave? I'm good, man. How are you? Good, good, to ha- good to have you on the the show here. We're gonna dig into a little bit of uh, some art and fly fishing art, and and uh, and some of the good stuff you've been doing. You've worked with a bunch of great companies out there in the past. Um, but maybe before we get there, I know you've done a little bit of fly fishing. Maybe you can talk about how you first uh, got into fly fishing. That's a good question. Um, uh, probably, I mean, I started off when I was a kid just pan fishing. And, uh, you know, just seeing fly fishing on TV shows, I was really interested, but no one really in my family did it other than just in front of the house catching bluegills. And eventually I talked my dad into bringing me to uh, the Pier Marquette River here in Michigan. And we fly fished. I mean, we, I think we went and bought you know, six flies. We each had three in our pocket and Mm -hmm. (laughs) we had those same rods that we, uh, catch bluegills on, but we eventually did catch one trout. And I mean, we were so excited about it. Um, but it wasn't until my college days that I really kind of dove into it head first. And, um, I would fish in Grand Rapids. There's a dam called the sixth street dam. Um, super famous place to go steal a steelhead fishing. And I would just sit uh, on the shoreline and watch everybody fish. But it was these guys with all these teched out uh, backpacks and pouches full of gear and uh, their fly rods and all different rigs. And I was so intrigued with they just looked like the coolest guys and they looked like they knew what they were doing and they were catching more fish than any of the guys with bait. And, um, one day I went down there and my cousin, uh, who had really gotten into fly fishing at the time, Ryan said, Hey, I got my, uh, spare rod in the car, go back and get that. And I'll show you kind of the ropes here. So I did. And, um, sure enough, caught a beautiful steelhead, like within 20 minutes. And that was it. I mean, I was absolutely sold on it. 
from that point on, that's all I, for probably the next, you know, 10 years, all I would do is fly fish. Now I do a little of everything, but, um, I was pretty obsessed and, uh, no, it was just a blast. And so Michigan, and are you still in Michigan now? I'm, I'm back in Michigan. We moved back here from Livingston, Montana. Um, we're now in the Traverse city area and, uh, it's great to be back to Michigan. I definitely, uh, miss Montana, but we, uh, head out there and, and hang out for a month during the fall. And, and that's a lot of fun too. So, yeah. So you're back in, uh, uh, you're back in steelhead country, right? Are, are you, are you still, is that, was that something you missed when you were gone in, in Montana for a while? Um, you know, a, a little bit, but, uh, there's so many different like fisheries out West that really kind of mimic the steelhead, just like Lake run rainbows. They're certainly not as big, but you can use a lot of the same methods. And so definitely could, uh, you know, itch that scratch while we were out there. No, I, and I always joked, I, I kind of always felt like I'm, I'm out, you know, West and steelhead's big, but for the longest time I was like, oh man, could I leave steelhead? But it's amazing because there's so many species, you know, to catch all around the world now. I mean, it's, I feel like I could probably live anywhere and be good with it. Uh, is that, do you feel like that a little bit or, or do you have a, I bet you must have some special connection like family in Michigan. Yeah. Well, with the fishing part of that, um, I just, you know, I, I think I could survive anywhere if there was like a good fishery for something. Cause yep. <laughs> I'm not that particular yesterday. Uh, we were out and we were trying to find smallmouth bass in an area I'd never been. And, uh, there was a good Brown Drake hatch happening in that Bay. And this is a Lake Michigan kind of fishery. And, um, it got slicked out. It was kind of, um, just barely sprinkling really kind of, uh, almost foggy, hazy. And, uh, I look and I see all these noses out in the bay fish, fish were rising. Went out there. It was mostly, uh, schools of carp, but there were also smallmouth taking, there were both spinners and there were actual, uh, a hatch going on. And, um, I didn't really have any dry flies, uh, yet, but I just put a little tiny leech on and we started stalking these carp, which, you know, gin clear water and dead calm, not real easy conditions. And, uh, but I, I got a couple pretty good shots on them that, that came close. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but I just tell that story because, you know, whatever comes up, it's just so much fun dissecting the situation and uh, trying to, you know, trying to apply your knowledge to it and figure it out. Yeah, totally. Totally. No, that is, that is the good way to look at it. I just had uh, Mike Schultz was on recently. He's a big, uh, I think, guy not far from you. And we talked to all smallmouth bass for like an hour plus. And yeah, tons of tons of good tips. I'll put a link to that one in the, uh, the show notes as well. Um, but um, but yeah, I want to dig in a little bit more uh, just on your background. The the art uh, is really you know, kind of a unique thing you, you have going. I mean, it seems like you're kind of what you're doing is leading out there a little bit on your style. And, um, we had a recently, uh, English coffee. Uh, I was talking to Joe and he kind of gave a shout out to you and, and I, and I circled around and, and tracked you down. And I, I want get, to get into a little bit of that maybe later on as we have time, but maybe just talk about a little bit on your art. I mean, how do you go from, is this, has this been a lifelong thing on the art and was the, has the fishing art always been there along with just the regular art? funny thing is, is it's always been fishing art. Oh, right. It's always been fishing. That's it. <laughs> um, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, uh, I didn't really think there was a job out there being a fish artist. Um, but that's, you know, most artists are good in, in the same way that a fly fisherman is because of their obsessive, uh, personality, you know, the obsessed people tend to figure it out. And I was obsessed with, you know, drawing and painting fish. And um, it was uh, fifth grade that I entered a statewide Michigan um, uh, youth wildlife um, art sh or art competition or show. And um, I, I th absolutely thought I was going to win the thing, no problem, because I'd been doing fish drawings for, you know, many years. And uh, didn't even get honorable mention. And I think there were 25 of those. And that was, 
you know, I think we all have uh, memories of a very early turning point in our lives. And that was mine. It was the little butt kicking that that I needed to realize I needed to uh, keep working and in, in improving even at that young age. And it, it kind of sparked my dad, too, because he he really thought that I was going to win, too. He thought my drawings were really great. And so how did I not win this? And uh, so he enrolled me, my mom and dad enrolled me in uh, private art lessons uh, every week with a local artist. And uh, that was just so integral um, to my development later on because I had all the basics down, you know. Um, So the next year I, I entered the same art competition, I ended up taking second place but using the new skills that I had learned in these art classes. And um, I was on my way. I mean, I was just absolutely uh, obsessed with becoming the best I could be at, at doing fish art. And, um, and then it was, uh, you know, uh, high school continued doing it. And uh, and then in, in uh, art school, college, um, I was kind of known as the, fish guy because every project I did you know the instructor never mentioned go ahead and elaborate and add fish to it but I would (laughs) (laughs) I would make every project about fish so uh, everyone got a good laugh out of it but to me that's what made it fun and kind of captured my imagination and I loved you know drawing fish in different environments and perspectives and just challenging myself in that way and and I knew that's what I wanted to do. So why not continue? Um, trust me, along the way, there's been a ton of people who have, uh, well, I think most people doubted whether it was going to really blossom into a career. But most people were like, Derek, you know, you're a very good artist. You could do other things. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's not what I want to do. I want to do this. There's a million other talented artists out there doing different things or trying to do the the subject that makes sense or that might make them money. I don't want to do that. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I love it. Yeah. Why do you, you know, um, like the fish? I mean, I know why, because obviously it's is the fishing, but for you, why do you love the fish arts? Why have you always loved the fish art actually drawing fish art so much? You know, probably a lot of your listeners have thrown a mask on and done some um, snorkeling. And, you know, you, you get into that underwater environment and start seeing this totally different world than what you see in your daily life. And it's happening in, there's all kinds of little creatures and the colors of the sun coming through different water and through seaweed, the way it refracts on everything. I mean, that world is just the world that I want to, you know, express in my art. It, it it inspires me. It's just nat- naturally where I'm drawn to. What's the, uh, you know, the obsession really uh, hits home to me because I've been, you know, I'm working on right now some uh, some ADHD, you know, talking about maybe, you know, doing something to address, not, not even address because I think there's a lot of people that that's actually probably a good thing. But I mean, what is the obsession to you? What does that look like over your life when you're 15? And have you been, have you had the same work ethic that whole time or what does obsession mean? Well, you know, I definitely um, had whatever it was AD or whatever. I don't know what you call it. And and they tried to get me on Ritalin. I was on it and it definitely tamed me a bit. Um, but I just kind of decided um, after about a year of, of using Ritalin that I'm like, you know what? Like, I am who I am. Like, yes, it, it is hard to be in school when you're um, ADHD or whatever, but I, you know, I think the energy and, and, uh, the obsession and you can concentrate very well on the things you want to concentrate on. That's like, the, that's yeah. the little that's niche the in, in, in that. Um, it's just, you have a really hard time concentrating on stuff that doesn't make sense to you or you don't want to listen to it. That's why school is so difficult for kids. Um, so I got back off it and you just have to learn to like kind of, you know, uh, work within that. And, um, 
I'm able to get everything done that I need to. So, you know, and that has taken years of work and effort to kind of work with that mentality. And, um, but I'm, uh, I'm a pretty heavy right brained guy and, uh, I don't want to take any drugs that are going to, you know, tame that I'd rather, I'd rather use that to, you know, my largest advantage. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. I think that I have heard stories of people, adults, adults even, you know, taking some of that stuff and it, it helping them be more productive in their in their work or whatever. But yeah, I've always felt the same way. I um, I remember when I was uh, I've told this maybe before, but I quit tobacco a long time ago, and uh, you know, it was one of those things. Part of it was because uh, I was getting heartburn at the time. And my doc said, hey, you can take this heartburn medication. It'll take care of it. And I was like, man, I don't want to take medication. I, there's got to be some life stuff that I could quit, you know, that'll get rid of that. But, um, you know, for you, I mean, ADHD is obviously different, and, and that's a totally different uh, story. And I don't want to focus completely on that here. But I, I just wanted to touch on, you know, just to get a feel for what how you've gotten to where you are. And it sounds like you've done it, you know, most of your life. So that gives you a head start. But what was it like when you first... You know, hit a, I'm not sure what the first big fly fishing or fishing uh, project was. What, can you bring us to that moment and what that felt like? Well, I'll tell you about uh, when I got out of art school, um, you know, you get done with art school and then you kind of scratch your head and go, I forgot to ask them like what I should do when I get out. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't teach you the business side of it? <laughs> no, like, uh, holy cow, I've got to like come up with something and actually put a plan together. Um, so what I did was, uh, my dad and I built a kind of 10 by 10, really terrible wood lattice like situation that could break down. I bought like a cheap trailer. We'd cover this lattice thing with like black material. It was the worst. <laughs> it took forever to set up and forever to break down. And I started doing, um, summertime fine art shows, um, outdoor. And, uh, man, those are so much work. If you ever go to an outdoor art show and you see an amazing display out there, you got to understand probably that artist and a family member or their spouse carried all that stuff like five blocks huh. or more in the blazing sun and carefully set it all up. I have so much respect for those artists that spend you know, their summers doing that or, or down South all year long. Um, but it was a blast. I met so many cool people, um, kindred spirits, other artists, and, um, was fun showing my art to people. My art was at the time, um, very different from other, um, kind of sporting, uh, art, fish art. And, um, it was a really fresh kind of young vibe to it. Um, a little more contemporary, um, some of the stuff borderline on not abstract, but just abstract, um, based upon that it had no kind of outer, uh, shape. Um, so just taking fish patterns and parts of the, their anatomy and, and their bright colors and using those as like kind of fuel for an abstract painting. Um, and that really, you know, hadn't been done. And, um, a lot of people hated it. I'm not going to lie that it was like a total turnoff to a lot of people. But the thing that kept me doing it was I was getting people that were just in love with it. Like people who would stay in my booth all day, just so happy to see something they'd never seen before and to, you know, talk with me about it. I knew I was on to something. I wasn't necessarily convinced I was doing it completely right or doing it justice, but I knew my idea was good. And, um, and I was winning first place at a lot of these, uh, juried art competitions. Um, I was coming home with a blue ribbon and no cash <laughs> at, at one point. Um, uh, my father-in-law who's a financial guy sat down with just a legal pad and said, Derek, what do you sell at these shows? What are the, what are the products? And he kind of goes through and he, Okay, how much? What you? What's your average? How many paintings are you selling? Okay, and how many prints? And you got little packs of note cards. All right, so we're looking at how many shows you're gonna do. And he does the math. Okay, like at at this current level, if you do that many shows, you're gonna make like nine thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, the cold, you know, reality of the situation sets in at that point. That's not how an artist's mind works, by the way. We we no. don't think that way. Um, you know, uh, payment for me is someone loving my art. And, you know, uh, eventually I did learn how to uh, kind of think that way a little more. Um, but I, I was happy that he did that because it really set a fire under my butt to change things and to start seeking new ways to sell my art. And, um, you know, that was when I really started thinking I need to move out West. Hmm. And, and so that was the next step. Oh, really? So, so that was, so you felt like uh, the most important thing was, or one of the more important things was to get to a different place where, and, and describe that as, I mean, I, I can't remember the town in Montana, but describe that versus where you were at. Um, I got out of art school during a recession. Um, Michigan is a very uh, auto industry based, you know, uh, more so in the past, things have changed a lot. Um, but still, if uh, auto industry jobs are declining and being laid off, um, if they're not thriving, no one thrives. And that like that, that like mindset that happens in that kind of economy you think the whole world is doing the exact same thing. Well, no one's buying art because, you know, jobs are hard to come by. You don't really think uh, outside of your little bubble until you get out. And then it's like, oh, my gosh, other places are thriving. Um, also, uh, next to that thing that was happening in Michigan, especially at the time, fish art really wasn't in vogue. You know, guys loved it, but the wife would, you know, totally put the kibosh on putting it in the living room. Oh, we're not putting that fish painting in our living room. It was not part of the culture at the time. Out West, um, fly fishing and fish art is so ingrained in the culture that, you know, I'm I, instead of, uh, trying to sell a painting that's going to go in the guy's like fishing den in the basement. I'm now trying to sell a painting for the most, you know, beautiful marquee spot in the entire home or in the business or wherever it's going to go. And that is just so much, you know, more gratifying and, and a, a lot better living to be made doing that. That was interesting. You mentioned about your father-in-law giving you a little coaching on the business side of it. And that was, so was that, I mean, it sounds like you were, you were married at the time or, cause that's interesting, right? So it sounds like you, um, or I guess, was that the case when your father-in-law gave you that coaching advice? Yep. Um, I was, uh, I was married, um, let's see, like three months after I graduated from school, from art school. And, um, I, I knew I had the right one and, uh, I knew I wanted to, uh, pursue, becoming a professional artist and what that was going to entail. I didn't know, but I kind of felt like I needed to put a ring on her finger in order to just justify dragging her through whatever was going to happen next. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It, it, Janelle, right? Yep. And that's Janelle. Yeah. And Janelle has been awesome. She's been uh, doing all the back uh, end stuff, setting this up. So that's been really, uh, really smooth and great um, with all that. But um so, so yeah, so that does make sense. And, you know, you had your father-in-law that came in there early, gave you a little coaching. And, and so, I mean, I know you've had some big collaborations. When you look at everything you've done, is there like some one big thing that sticks out that you're like, wow, that was a pretty amazing, or do they all kind of stick out to you? Um, you know, probably the, um, my first real, uh, licensing thing was with Sims. And that was like the year after I moved out West. And I'll give you a little insight into this. It's kind of a funny story. Um, they kind of came to me and asked if I would, um, you know, work with them doing different products, blah, blah, blah. When it came down to it, they gave me a, a contract. And I can't remember what the number was, but essentially they got to use my art for free. Oh, wow. You know, they paid me, but very, very little. And, uh, I just thought to my, and, and you know, it's always with artists, um, it's always, we, we hear nonstop, it's going to be the, um, the exposure, 
you know, the exposure right. is really a big value here. We're, you're going to get some money, but the exposure. That you're was gonna, their argument. <laughs> well, every, that's everybody's argument yeah. when they try to uh, get, you know, cheap art from an artist. Gotcha. And um, I didn't know what to do about it. I had a different opportunity that was with a, uh, another company. Um, and uh, it wouldn't have been as kind of um, upfront in the fly fishing industry, but it was a lot better money. And so I, I, I guess that emboldened me uh, to be a little harder of a negotiator. So I, I um, reached out to one of my um, professors from Kendall College and asked, like, you know, how do I deal with this situation? And she sent me a link to this book. So I ordered the book and read through all the uh, material. I mean, it's a huge book. It's like the handbook for visual artists. And they they uh, do a new edition every like four years. So all the numbers are pretty current. So I took a highlighter and I highlighted all the stuff laid out for uh, essentially doing a licensing agreement like we were looking at doing. And I went into the next meeting and just set the book down and they they said, uh, well, what's it going to take to make this happen? We know you didn't like that first offer. And I slid the book across. I'm like, I'm not looking to get rich, but this is what the current standard is. And this is what I want. And they were like, deal. So uh, that was kind of cool because it was so early in my career. And it was so cool to be able to strike a fair deal with a big company. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I kind of set the standard at that time for what it was to work with artists in, in fly fishing that, that, uh, negotiation kind of, uh, was what, you know, other artists called me and asked me what I did and what, you know, what was the industry standard and what to ask for. And then it just seems like, um, with, you know, this, the way it is right now, um, there's so many new artists that have come out and so much talent out there. But the unfortunate thing is that I don't think any of them are good negotiators because the entire like uh, industry as far as selling licenses has just kind of become so saturated and all these younger artists are willing to do it for next to nothing. And so that's the new standard. And so that's kind of tough. Oh, wow. Wow. So that's it. So, and just going back quickly on that book. So was it called the handbook for visual artists? I believe it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll put a link to that. I mean, this is really, inter- I'm glad you started this episode because it's, uh, you know, for a lot of these companies, I've interviewed a lot of smaller companies as well that are in this space. And um, yeah, it's challenging. I mean, you got Sims and some of these big companies. And um, I mean, what you're talking about here is your valuation, right? I mean, what are what are you, what is your service or your products? What are they worth? Here's what it comes down to as an artist. um, You know, we are we are usually out there and pretty right brained. And that's what makes us so intuitive and sensitive and able to come up with good art. But that's also what makes us suckers in the business world. And, you know, it is such a stereotype that, you know, big business can pretty much get art from artists for next to nothing. And that makes it impossible for artists to make a living. So it's so important that you learn to run your business, figure out what the industry standard is and stick to that, even if you lose the job, because you're just, you know, you're just ruining what the industry, now the industry standard is different. It's not what that book says. It is because all these people will do it for free. That is the new standard. So you do have to protect it if you want, you know if you want to be able to make a living from that, you know, that type of work. And, and that was, so that Sims moment, that was the moment where you realize you're like, okay, this is, I mean, was that the moment you realize this, this is going to be, had you known before that, that for sure you could do this as a career full time, no problem. Well, or maybe no problem is a little too. <laughs> yeah. Like that sounds a little, um, a little cocksure to me. I wasn't quite there. Uh, but I was, um, It was about then that I was, you know, catching on. I was doing tons of shows. And once I signed on with Sims, which that was a a really great um, company to break in my career and into the fly fishing world. Um, 
so that was a fantastic thing and probably you know early on especially the the most um exciting license that i did um but uh yeah we i started doing all the little um like fly fishing days across the west with the sims rep he was like, dude, you come with me. We'll, we'll uh, caravan or whatever, camp, fish, and you do all the shows with me because I got to go show new product and you can use it as a platform to show your art. So I did. And, um, you know, it's a little, a little different mentality than what's happening right now with like the immediate gratification of Instagram and TikTok and whatever you use. Um, everyone in the world can see what you're doing and you don't even have to do any real work. Um, you know, I'm not trying to downplay that cause I think there's some really good things about it, but you can't replace, you know, all the time and effort it takes to do, you know, 30 shows in a summer. I mean, that's a dedication that is, uh, far exceeding sitting in your studio and using your cell phone to make a little video or take a picture. Um, and not only that, I got to meet people, you know, face to face and shake hands and actually make friends. And, and that was important to me. Um, and so at that point I, I was starting to be booked out, you know, past a year to, to complete a painting, um, a custom commission. Um, so at that point I felt pretty sure that as long as I kept getting better at this, in working is, you know, is harder, harder or getting smarter that, yeah, this was going to be my career for the rest of, you know, my life. There you go. There you go. How do you, um, I guess just quickly, I'm just curious, just generally, uh, I mean, uh, on a piece, I know there's probably lots of variation, but what does that take you to, to produce a, a cus, uh, you know, an uh, original Dave, if you haven't heard it before 41 years. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Is that, that, that's it. <laughs> And that's the only answer anyone can give you um, because, it, you know, I've done things so many times and, and taken lessons from those things. So would you say that they are part of a current painting? You know, they, they really are. I had to do 100 paintings to get here. Togan's Fly Shop providing superior quality products at an affordable price, an amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools and fly fishing accessories. Togans has you covered when looking for unique in-house products, but also supports and supplies materials and tools from other leading fly brands you know and trust. Togans is now offering their mystery fly tying box where they simplify the process for you in choosing materials. You're only one click away from these hand-picked subscription tying boxes that are packed with value at almost half the cost. And I recently made a order through Togans and the experience was perfect. After a uh, recent trip uh, nipping for trout, I had to replace my tungsten beads and some jig hooks and a few other items. The products arrived in a couple of days from Togans with a nice little card, a bonus value, and a welcome note from the Togans family. Since 2005, Togans has been over delivering on price and customer service, so it's time to discover for yourself what the buzz is all about. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans and take a look at their diverse selection of products today. You can support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Togans online. That's wetflyswing.com slash T-O-G-E-N-S. Togans. You know, you talked about getting better. So, I mean, are you quicker now as far as, you know, if you had to draw that now, would you be quicker? And also, um, are you are you still getting better every time? Well, that that's a great question. And I hope so. And I really, really... Um, my measure of success, um, in my career and for myself every day is that I get better. And I really think that, um, you know, as an artist, each of us are blessed with X amount of talent, but the intangible is how hard are you going to work to develop it And it, in it, like that quality of your work only goes up just incrementally with tons of hard work. I mean, it's like, um, you know, you don't get rock hard abs from a week's worth of sit-ups. It, it happens over time and just lots of paintings and lots of experiences. But if you commit yourself lifelong to it and you truly, you know, 
the end goal is to just be a old gray bearded man that is just killing it and making the best paintings of his career. That is what I want. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so I, I hold myself to that standard with every piece. Um, and, and especially now in my career, um, you know, I, there's a lot of projects I just don't take on, um, because they're, they're not going in a direction that would lead me to be, you know, growing as an artist or becoming better, pushing my, my portfolio. So, yeah, that's it. So you are always pushing it. Are you still, are you still as obsessed uh, now as you were when you were 15? More, more, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's like anything that once you start obsessing all these new doors open and then you start going in all those and all these new doors open and it's you know the more you can do uh the better you get at it the more you can achieve and you become more and more critical and discerning of of how the painting is going to look or or you know the concept of it or uh the palette and push it further and further and further so Every painting I've done before, the one I'm going to work on today is a building block for what I'm going to do today and and how far I can push it. That's, um, I thought about that a little bit. You know, I've had a number of, um, you know, I guess artists, you know, writers and lots of people. I, and I've heard the stories about how people work, you know, um, about how it's important to get up right at the same time. Do the work, you know, do the work. Don't don't miss out. What, can you just take us through a quick little, like a, a typical day in the life? Like, are you are always, you know, in your week doing a similar thing or how's that look? <laughs> well, no, um, I'm extremely easily bored. Um, as far as with the work, um, I will do something highly detailed and representational of the subject. Maybe I'll do something really creative in in left field with like the palette, but it, it'll take a lot of different, you know, a lot of layers of of polishing and work to bring the painting up to to the finished thing. The very next painting I'm going to do, and this is just because I've done this for so long, I understand how my brain works, is going to be really loose and um, energetic and quicker to get from start to finish, but not necessarily not as good of a painting, just a totally different energy and style. And that like is so good for me. You know what I mean? In my, in my creative uh, brain, just allowing, you know, taking, taking the uh, harness off and just letting my brain do its thing. It's like the colors don't have to make sense. Um, sometimes painting really intuitively can just be so gratifying if if you're an artist and you're listening and you're trying to create these extremely representational paintings just try taking the reins off and just paint by intuition let your let your brain tell you oh this color needs to go here and this you know let's let's draw this over here and you know get rid of all the uh all the things that make you feel like you have to be so accurate and and it can really i think uh just just make you feel better it's cathartic well put so it sounds like and there's a little bit of variation in your day but that that kind of explains a little bit about how you get there um do you see i mean it sounds like there's a lot of people out there um i don't know if there's a lot of people doing similar things out there but do you are there other artists uh, you see now um that are doing something similar or are you considered like great artists well both yes there are some amazing artists in, in my field. And, uh, just that I look at their work and I'm like, oh, I'm just like so psyched that they are going down this road and coming up with this work. And, and, uh, it just, <clears throat> it's awesome. Um, and then there's a lot of really talented, uh, artists that, you know, maybe, uh, build their portfolio off of my ideas and, you know, that's okay too. It, it, it bums me out a little bit when they take full credit for not only the painting and the execution of it, but also the concept of it. Cause it, you know, it took me a long time in my life to come up with this stuff. It wasn't overnight. So, um, sometimes I can, I can get a little bit, uh, disappointed in that, but you know, it is what it is. I think it happens in every 
industry with every product. Um, if you uh, have a good fly fishing product, you're going to be the only one in the market to have it for only one season. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. That's how it is. <laughs> that's I've heard that about uh, jokingly, you know. Uh, well, and, and truthfully, just with products too. You know, you hear like line companies, right? You hear somebody joking about how, yeah, oh, yeah, you, you got about a year until somebody's going to have your same. In fact, even a similar naming structure. Um, and, uh, I always go back to the podcasting because that's kind of my art, you know, and I think about, you know, new people coming in and how I do it. And, you know, I found that I tend to try to not, I don't listen to a lot of other podcasts in, in our niche because I like to right. try to just do my own unique thing. Do you find that, that over, over time you kind of stuck with your own, your own thing and didn't really look at what other people were doing? Well, early on for sure. Um, but as it's become so, um, easy to just drum up. Instagram in the morning and, and I follow all these artists. Um, <clears throat> I love seeing, you know, what other people are up to, what they're doing. It's a, it's a easy way for me to connect. Um, I love messaging other artists and encouraging them because I know what that does and I know how important it is. Um, especially I'm a, I'm a guy that you probably want to talk about art with, you know, cause I know what it takes to make it. And, uh, and I really appreciate what they're doing. I did want to talk about English Coffee. They've, um, like I said, Joe um, has been somebody. Actually, we have a podcast with Joe where I dug in. He, they're a sponsor of the podcast, and it's just oh, a really, cool. co- it's a really cool story. You know, I love Joe's story because talk about probably ADHD, a guy that you know made lots of money in a previous business and started a, a fly fishing or a coffee company focused on fishing because you know he just loved doing what he that's does what he yeah you know what i mean yeah. like that that just shows you the guy has enough money that he doesn't have to worry about it but that's him and so i just love the story and, and part of that was i said joe you know you got to connect me i, I want to bring somebody on that you, you you would like to hear you know and he re- and he mentioned you and you, obviously your name's popping around everywhere so you probably would have come on eventually anyways but i just want to talk just so people understand what you guys are doing with anglers because I, I don't want to miss i haven't heard the story of what you have coming can you describe um, what you're doing for them we're doing some uh, packaging with them, and um, it's featuring some of my fish faces, which is one of my longest standing painting series. And I still love doing them, um, and and they just look awesome, you know, on a bag like that, super colorful. And you know, people who don't know what they're looking at, it'll take them a minute to figure out that it's uh, different trout. That's good. That gives us a little bit of a taste. So the, and the fish faces is, I mean, where could we find that if we wanted to go look at some of just your, 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 what you've done? I mean, could people actually right now buy a print? You, yeah. Um, on my website, DerekDeYoung.com, um, we have, you know, you can hit the shop button and that's going to bring you to where you can actually buy, um, prints in all of our available prints. We try to, um, offer prints, uh, of, of every new painting. Um, but there's a lot of older paintings that aren't available as, um, in, in our print section. So if you want to see those, um, they're not really archived by year, but, um, if you go into the gallery section and then pick, you know, what type of fish you want to look at, brown trout, saltwater, tarpon, permit, um, uh, you'll be able to see kind of the full collection of, of most everything I've done, um, of that, of that species. And, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how to find it. So that's it. So basically, yeah. And I'm, I'm in the gallery now. So yeah, you've got like, for example, for steelhead, you've got a bunch of different takes. So these are, these are uh, pieces that you've already, you know, from Pat, your whole life, really some of this stuff, is there a good, yeah. Uh, yeah. Early on, even some, some, uh, you know, from right after art school or the very end of art school. Yeah. Yeah. Who was your, um, I'm just curious because this gets me thinking. I think if there are some artists that are probably even older than you out there, that um, one I'm thinking of is like, uh, uh, do you, you know, Ray Troll. Have you seen much of his work? Yeah, yeah, Ray yep. Troll. I mean, he's a he was a kind of a bigger than life person. I remember I met him once, and uh, he was a very, uh, uh, very uh, robust personality and stuff like that. But you know, when you think of his art, his is pretty. Uh, I don't know if I'd say out. I guess out there, but. Um, are there other mentors? Uh, was Ray or were there other people that kind of mentored you or have, uh, was a lot of this started on your own? You know, I, I wouldn't say I ever had a mentor, but I definitely, um, you know, looked to the people who are doing this 
before me to get an example of, you know, what's possible. And, um, you know, I, I was, I was always interested in doing it my own way, you know? Um, so there was never an issue with, you know, stepping on the toes of the people who were already doing it. Um, but just as far as what, what business opportunity is there, you know, what kind of, um, commercial value is there? Are they, are they licensing? Are they making product, um, t-shirt sales, stickers? What, you know, how do you sell your art if you're not actually going to sell an original painting? And so, um, I definitely had my eye out on what was happening at the time, but what's kind of amazing in our, you know, our industry, you know, is things have changed so much since I started and it's, it's been amazing to see. And, um, printing technology has just gone crazy. When I first started, you had to order like, you know, 500 or a thousand of a print in order to make it feasible to sell it at a price people would pay. And you had to like sell through that edition. Now the printing technology is just so much better. And you, you know, you do digital G clay printing and, um, is it like print on demand now? Sort of now stuff? it's, yeah, you don't have to, uh, keep, you know, stock of every single thing you can order as it, as you know, needed. Um, that's huge. That's huge. That's why I'm able to offer so many different paintings, not just, you know, not just two brown trout, two tarpon, you know, a brook trout, like, so. There you go. So pretty much you can get anything and I'm just kind of still searching through you got, yeah, I mean, you've got, uh, you got art on anything, right? Could you pretty much get, if I wanted to get something, some clothing item, uh, like a, a hoodie or whatever you could, you could, could you buy that right now? It's absolutely out there. Um, but let me yeah. <laughs> give you some idea of, of what Janelle does. Uh, I think she told me we had 257 SKUs right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, there's, I mean, every day people get in touch with ideas for product and it's like, they're good ideas while well, some of them are in, uh, and, but it's just like, there's only so many things you can do. And we have a warehouse and it's like, you know, we pay to have that product there. We have to pay to have a uh, shelf space. So it's like the more you have, then, you know, it comes back to that lesson my father-in-law gave me. You got to start looking at the numbers. So what are your SKUs if you had to think of one SKU? Because we're talking, you still, it sounds like you do original art for people and stuff. But if, is there a, well, maybe you don't know this, maybe Janelle again could answer this, but is there one SKU or one type of, you know, art? print or whatever that you do that gets more, um, you know, more traction or more sales? For sure. Um, phone cases are just, you know, one of those weird items that, you know, when I first started this business, I would have never understood that that would be a way that a lot of people want to, you know, display art and show their, their passion for fly fishing. And, so we sell a lot of phone cases and um, we started off, we kind of learned our lessons as we went. We started off with a cheaper uh, com company doing fly or doing phone cases and they were doing phone cases throughout like the fly fishing industry. So a lot of different companies were using them and they would crack and they would, uh, you know, not go on the phone. Right. There was so many issues and um, you know, it, it becomes kind of not very much fun to make that product if that's the case. So since then we've partnered with, uh, established phone case companies and, um, stuck with that, even though it's more expensive and we make a lot less money. Um, we offer the, you know, the industry standard best phone cases with my art on them. And they're all, you know, they're all, uh, warranted from that company. So that has made, you know, dealing with issues so much, you know, more streamlined and, and made a lot happier customers too, I think. Yeah. I see these things. I think they're like right now, $45 for a case. And I mean, I've, I found the more I get into this, that the premium products, you know, I mean, that seems like the better place to go because if you go, you, you can't win on price. I mean, you know, so you might as well have something that's higher quality and, 
Um, and the, yeah, these are beautiful, man. You got a bunch of, you got the rainbow, you got the, the harvest moon, um, which is pretty cool. The harvest moon, this is good. You got the moon out there with a little, uh, looks like a mayfly. And that one looks kind of similar. You know, when I mentioned the Ray Troll, you know, his stuff is, he's got stuff like this, the spawning run, right? He'll have like a salmon yep. with legs and stuff like that, but uh, <laughs> maybe a little more out there. But that, yeah, the harvest moon kind of reminds me a little bit of of maybe, you know, his, that style of, of uh, yeah, it's not quite, it's it, not well, his fish. Like, yeah. You know, one, one way to kind of look at art is, um, you know, obviously the execution, how was it painted? Um, what's it painted of? Um, but also concept. And I think, you know, if I were to look at Ray Troll's work, it's very concept, uh, like kind of based on puns, uh, which is hilarious and just brings his sense of humor to canvas. Um, mine is not pun based. Um, so mine is much more like kind of whimsical, fantastical, like what what would I want to see right here? What would just totally blow my mind? And I have seen a lot of these things. Um, and really, you, you couldn't photograph or represent it in that way. Um, but it's in my mind and, and I'm able to I'm I'm able to draw it and turn it into a painting. Yeah. And on the, sp the spotting, like, for example, I'm looking at one, the brown trout or whatever it's. So on that spotting pattern, when you're doing this, are you, I mean, you're not necessarily taking like a photo you took and, and kind of, you know, designing something off of that. This is more from memory or how, how you know, because I'm looking at these spottings, right? The brown, tr this um, rusty spinner, it's amazing. Um, how, how does that look? I'm just curious, you know, what you get? You know, it's like throughout uh, different, different little parts of my career, you know, I've kind of set standards for what I was going to do. And, and there were there was a time when I tried to look at no reference at all. Um, and like you say, just use the image in my head and that, that like produced a very different painting. Um, and I, I still think there's a lot of value to it. Um, cause it's very kind of put through the filter of the artist's brain, you know, um, who cares if it doesn't look just like, a a photo like there's plenty of photos that are wonderful out there like i wanted to to really bring the artistry um side um now uh currently I, i'm i don't follow a photo um either but i will look at references and i i'll pick out uh little intricate things that make that fish different and um the shape of his snout or the kipe or uh, spot pattern um, that is really interesting um, or just just like unexpected and I'll you know I'll use that you know little pieces of different things if I ever paint like a brown trout you're really seeing that I've looked at probably uh, a half dozen like a half dozen pictures for that specific painting that I just put on my phone and glanced at different things the the fin color I mean let me ask you a question. What color is the pectoral fin of a brown trout? Ooh, that's a great question. That's a great well, question. Well, you, you could say a lot of colors and you'd be right. And it just depends where it came from. What, you know, is it a lake run fish? Um, is it during the spawn? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to me to get those things right. Um, if I'm doing a, if I'm doing a representation of a fish in spawning colors, I, I want to um, do, you know, justice to what those fins should look like. What colors are they? So do you get people uh, occasionally that say, hey, I would like to have a steelhead from the Great Lakes sort of thing and, and all of that? Or, or is it or do you kind of keep it more general for your new original art? I haven't had someone say that, no. Um, but they will send some pictures of a steelhead um, and say where they caught it. And, and if I could like kind of, you know, capture the, the coloration or the shape of that fish and, and that, you know, that's pretty normal. Um, but, you know, um, I would say, I mean, I paint steelhead. I definitely have painted quite a few steelhead. I paint a lot of different saltwater fish, but the bulk of what I paint would be tarpon brown trout brook trout 
and then everything else starts to disperse from there. Yeah. But, you know, I used to like, well, people often, um, you know, kind of message me or contact me and say, well, why aren't you doing more redfish? Well, here's the thing is I have caught plenty of redfish, but it's just not like, it's not like on that forefront of my passion to catch redfish. It, I love doing it. Trust me. I, if I was better at it and there were more of them around my house, I would do it more. And then I'd probably paint it more. But uh, the longer I've been in this art game, the more I realize you've got, you've got to be you and you've got to um, focus on the things that you're passionate about and, and it will come through in the painting. Um, people won't know why, but they'll know, they'll see the passion. And um, the things that I really like doing in the fish that I really like fishing for and that I know the most about um and that that's that's not just you know fishing for them i i plant gopros um and, and get my own footage and uh take my, a lot of my own references and, and occasionally do use some references from other photographers which uh is really helpful and i'm thankful that they let me occasionally uh cherry pick some but it, usually it's just like a, the position of a fish or, or just the posture of a fish that i'll take from um, a photo and, and then it goes, you know, then it goes totally from there in a different direction. I'm looking at the, the, the hex hatch and that one, I'm, I'm sure guy fishing in towards night, you know, there's a, ha there's the hatch coming off and you got this fish coming up to slurp a bug. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. It comes from your passion. You do a lot of that. Um, and then there's some other ones. Yeah. There's other ones in here that maybe look a little, um, I don't know if it's anatomically correct, but do you find yourself, um, you know, thinking about that in your head, like how close to that do you get versus more, I guess, is impressionistic the word for that when it doesn't look maybe as correct? You know, I guess the question to ask myself as I'm painting is, is, is this adding to the painting or is this making it a lesser quality painting? Um, and I think, um, as the years have gone on, I have gotten, better at just drawing more anatomically correct fish but i also still love kind of deviating from that and exaggerating some features a little bit um not in a way that makes them just like crazy but just you know i don't like doing like little stalkers okay i, I like doing the big dominant buck with the big jaw and the you know really developed kipe and i mean i don't that's what i like so that's what i paint and you know um you got to paint what speaks to you i think that's good advice no it's great great to hear so um i guess uh, derek we're going to take this out really quick here um i just have a few kind of random questions this isn't necessarily right on uh, with the art but i'm curious because i was looking at your instagram feed a little bit and i saw i think did you have like a Taco or a, some sort of a toyota gray pickup with a big like ready for like a overlanding adventure is that your truck Yep, yep. That's the the new adventure mobile we've put together. There you go. So I, I'm curious about this because I just actually had, and I I occasionally veer off a little bit. Sometimes I get flack for it. People want to hear more fly fishing focused, you know, stuff. But I love to veer off a little bit. I kind of feel like it's stretching our podcast a little bit. And I did a episode with um, a person I know, Brent, who has this Oregon AT, and he sells these campers. And we got into a lot of it. Was more like you know, what do you need on your on your trip if you're going into the into the woods to be safe. But we talked about those campers and it looks like you have one. Well, what is that, that camper on the back? Is that, is there a company there that we could look at? Yep. It's a four wheel camper and they're out of Southern California. Um, I drove 18 hours one way to go get it. The only way I was able to get it was, um, someone canceled. And, and I think they have like five different, um, distributors around the, or, or sales, um, places around the U S. Um, and they all have the ability to jump in and take that canceled order. Um, cause they're way out over a year to get one. And, um, anyway, I called that Friday afternoon and left them a message and then called that Monday at like 8 AM when they opened and the guys like literally just walked in, didn't even have his first cup of coffee. And he's like, dude, like, you won't believe this, but there's a cancellation right here and you can have the spot. No one else has claimed it. So I got super lucky and was able to order it and uh, trick it out the way I wanted. And 
Um, at the same time, ordered uh, a new Toyota Tundra. And, you know, this winter, that was kind of our project was watching YouTube and uh, figuring out what we wanted to do to the truck and to the camper. And also we set up a, um, a one month loop out through Montana. And uh, so that's just been for Janelle and I, it's been kind of our, our hobby for this year, something different. That's perfect. And and on that camper, does it, um, is there a model of it so we can take a look at that? Is it more, it pops up, right? And then you have a sleeping area at the top. Well, four wheel campers, they, um, they're coming out with some new stuff, but the commonality between all of them is they are pop-ups. Um, on my half ton pickup, um, it's the Hawk model that I have. Uh, it, it drives beautifully. I've got the, you know, V8 engine, but it's not a three quarter ton or a one ton pickup. Um, And I think the thing that I didn't understand before I talked to people who had truck bed campers was how um, unpleasant it is to drive cross country with a big sail above your truck. And um, this does not feel that way. It cuts through the wind and, um, it was great. I I just got back last night from Pictured Rocks up in uh, Munising in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, um, and that was kind of my first real camping trip out of it. Um, we were way way back in the wilderness at a KOA uh, campground. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I don't know that area, so I wasn't yeah. sure if I was going to be able to. And plus, I have a. 23 foot long bay boat behind me. So how far down a trail do I want to pull that thing? Um, the, the real, uh, goal here was to, uh, just try the camper and, um, and be in the boat all day out, uh, in Lake Superior. If you haven't seen the uh, South shore of Lake Superior, it's just insane. And it was so much fun to be out there and, and checking everything out and exploring, you know, 300 foot cliffs, like just crazy um sandstone like formations and they call it pictured rocks because there's like all different minerals have kind of over the years like made stripes down the face of the walls wow that was, that was cool yeah i'll have to I'll, I'll put a link out to that and um and i'll make note. well check yeah. check out my uh instagram okay um, dot d young and i've posted a few videos and some photos of that trip and um Oh, so good. you can check out what that actually is. Good. And that's kind about. of around the, just for time. So people get this in the future, this is around like June, May, June, when you posted those. It's yeah. Yeah. Right now. Right now. Oh yeah. Right now. Okay, good. Well, yeah, no, I'm always interested. Like I said, I had this episode, um, you know, on, I'm, I'm looking, I'm in the market too for something. And that's what Brent said. He said, well, you, you better have a, a year or whatever it was. And uh, yeah, and those things aren't cheap, but that's that's the thing is that you get a camper, and then it, that's it, right? It's pretty much a canopy. There's not a, there's not anything else in it other than a bed, right? That pops out. Um, go on their website; they have all kinds of different things you can oh, um, add to it. Yeah, you know, right. add to it. Um, but <laughs> uh, mine has a king bed. Um, it has a full bed. I mean, in the space of the camper, they've done some serious engineering uh, to make that work. But super comfortable. Um, real easy to pop up. It does have, I mean, there's not much room in there. Um, and there's, there's just barely what you need, but nothing extra. I'm a big guy. And so if I'm in there, no one else is like, if I'm cooking or organizing, it's like my buddy's not sitting in there with me. It's just, it's really just where we kind of base camp from. I can cook in there. It's got a heater. It's got, um, I think probably the thing I was most impressed with, it has two uh, max fans, I think they're called, and you put one blowing in and one blowing out. And by the time we'd wake up in the morning, there was no condensation in there. It was, it just felt fresh. You know, you weren't sweaty because there was so much fresh air constantly going through the camper. Um, And that's just kind of a complaint most people have about campers is that they're just kind of, you know, uh, just kind of musty and, and, and not that, that fresh feeling in the morning. Um, what else? We, we were in a torrential downpour. There were actually, um, tornadoes in the lower part of the state. Uh, one of the nights we were camping, but 
one of the back windows actually did leak. And uh, so we're trying to figure out out exactly what we need to do about that um but this torrential downpour was essentially like dunking the whole camper underwater it was <laughs> in, in the uh the canopy was well worth its money because we had our camp chairs and and some whiskeys and just sat there watching the wall of water come past us uh you know it, it was cool it actually was fun all right. Well, and, and two quick ones. I'm not sure. Do you listen to any other podcasts? You, do, uh, is that something you uh, you do at all? You know, I'm not really a podcast guy, um, so no. Okay, but... good, good. Well, that, that scratches <laughs> so that, that. that scratches that one off. That's good. The other one I want to check with you on music. What about music? Do you have a, a band or a type of music or something you listen to? Good question, and and that is uh, yes. I am super um, into music and. Uh, if you're around me, um, there is always music playing in our house. Um, we have wires kind of tapped in or speakers tapped in and there's always some type of music and I'm always changing it. One morning it'll be, uh, jazz then it'll be like classical and then go straight to like outlaw country. And, um, for, uh, we had a bass tournament with friend, friends and, and family, uh, it was about a week ago and I spent like two hours, uh, one night putting together a playlist for bass camp. And, uh, I didn't tell anyone I did this. And, and so as we're fishing, uh, we do a one day of pre fish and then the tournament is on Saturday and I, I play the, uh, playlist and it's all really funny music that I kind of searched out. And, uh, my buddies are looking at me like, what is, what are you playing? And I'm like, well, just listen to it. I'm not going to tell you. And man, we had such a good laugh about it. It was so worth the time I put in because like, you know, it just, it makes it so much more fun. Yeah. What, what was, is there one song that we could look, uh, look up on the funny? On the <laughs> no, no, it's all, I'm not going to say, but okay. it was, uh, gotcha. it, it was some stuff that most, uh, immature guys would oh, find you. really funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what about a, um, what about a, is there a band or a, a group or anything you, you kind of, you, you give a shout out to? You know, I'm, I'm pretty old school in my, um, I, I do like some, some newer pop stuff. Um, but a lot of what I listen to on a regular basis is, you know, older, um, outlaw country yeah, and like Willie older, Nelson. Old, older rock. Yeah. Um, those are probably my go-tos. Um, uh, yeah, I love, uh, some of the lesser known outlaw country guys. And I like that time period. Who's a lesser known. I'm just kind of curious. Cause I want to get it. I always think of what I think outlaw. I think of like Waylon, Willie. Yeah. J- yeah. Johnny. That's, that's the group. Um, well, like even like Chris Christopherson is part of that, but I, I mean, I love some of his stuff. It's amazing. He was a great songwriter too. Um, uh, uh, Guy Clark, Guy Clark was like, uh, just an amazing songwriter and just, you know, you look him up on Austin City Limits and watch his old like lo- you know, singer songwriter performances, and it's like that dude is so cool. Like, it's yeah. So Guy Guy Clark um, is a good one to check out. That's perfect. Yeah, I was trying to nail you down. We've got a little bit of a, a Spotify channel at uh, wetflyswing.com slash music where uh, I'm trying to pick a guest uh, track to throw on there so people can listen up. So. And you can message me later and I'll tell you some of the tracks from uh, the boat mix. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Perfect. All right, Derek. Hey, I'll let you get out of here. Uh, Thanks for going on that random track and for, you know, uh, just sticking with me here. This has been fun getting to know what you do. And I know you're obviously you're out there all over the place in the fishing world. So I think a lot of people already have seen your stuff. I know I've got a buff here. I know that's another company you worked with. I've got a, I'm not even sure what species it is, right? That's another thing you did. Yep. Yeah. We've worked with Buff for a lot of years and that's a great company. All right, Derek. Well, I'll keep in touch and, uh, and check back with you when this thing gets ready to go. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you, uh, spend the time today. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me this morning. Appreciate it. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash two, four, four, 244. Uh, one last reminder, I just want to thank Derek again and Angler's Coffee for this reminder. Um, and uh, head over to right now, wetflyswing.com slash anglers. 
just over to Angler's Coffee and uh, check out their bags right now. You can get some amazing fly fishing art, some of Derek's fish faces. I think that's the, the, the name of the print, some different fish. So go find your favorite fish face and and uh, go get a bag of coffee. It's it's killer coffee. As you, uh, if you've heard of this, you know I've I've uh, been loving the Angler's Coffee. So that's all I have for you. That's a wrap. Uh, Thanks again for stopping by with us today. I'm definitely looking forward to staying in touch with you and hope you can check in uh, right now. Head over to social or uh, or send me an email. Drop me a line. Let me know you're out there listening and I can uh, keep going strong. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 